country. And um, tonight, this is revolting news, and we're with uh, Bertel Ullman as our guest. That's not the revolting news. No, that's not. That's the that. title of your program, right? Yeah, Bertel Ullman, or revolting news. <laughs> He's a professor at um, New York University in the Department of Political Science, but we won't hold that against them. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about what is happening in um, the former Soviet Union. Uh, last week or so, there was uh, a lot of people were killed. There was a, what was a rebellion, which is called uh, various other things. Rebellion is a kind of neutral term. Um, I watched it on CNN minute by minute, Federal State, and then give the uh, the program over to Bertel. Uh, is that, uh, of course, I'm a pacifist, so it's easy for me. I didn't approve the violence that that went on on either side, but I thought that. Uh, Demo communist democracy, which is what I believe in, or anarchism, would have had a better chance if the anti-Yeltsin uh, forces would have won, because they're in such disarray and they have such a wide spectrum that there might have been an opening for uh, uh, other better plans to come through. Now, Bertel, what is your take on the whole thing? Well, let me start with your comment about the anti-Yeltsin anti forces. Yeah. Uh, we didn't see the anti-Yeltsin forces in those events. This was a conflict between two factions of the Yeltsin forces. I think that's a very important point to make. Uh, but let me, let me approach it a slightly different way. What I found most interesting in the events of last week was who were not present who did not participate in any way, who stayed home and, like you, watched the events on television. And that was the great, great majority of the Russian people, uh, and in particular, of practically the entire working class of Russia. Uh, the numbers of people involved in these events that were on TV were very small. The, the people who are uh, gathered before the, the parliament and broke through the pre police lines, their numbers were given as something between 10 and 15,000 people. Uh, the, these are very small numbers given the size of political demonstrations uh, in Russia. Uh, Yeltsin's demonstration toward the end of the Gorbachev range, uh, reign uh, often involved as many as a quarter of a million people. Uh, and then the people who came out in support of Yeltsin were even a smaller number than that. Uh, what we really saw happening here was a dispute, certainly a violent dispute, between two factions of Yeltsinites. Uh, and the evidence for this is that the people in the parliament that Yeltsin abolished were practically to a person pro-Yeltsin supporters as recently as two years ago. Uh, this is the parliament that uh, helped make Yeltsin president of Russia, a parliament which gave him the, uh, the power to rule by decree once he became uh, president, a, power, a, a group of people who support him uh, almost completely as regards his goals but many of them disagree with him as to the means and in particular how quickly those means should be put into operation to secure those goals, those goals being having to do with turning Russia into a capitalist society. Now what's interesting is to see why this split has occurred within the forces which were very recently all together in support of Yeltsin and the policies that he represented as opposed to those represented by Gorbachev and the old regime. Uh, that's really what's of special interest, how the split occurred, and also what the fact that there has been this break now within the Yeltsin forces, what that means 
for the future contests coming up, which I think is going to be really the, the, the big show, the, the, the show under the, the Big Ten, which is going to pit Yeltsin or what's left of his supporters, uh, and that great mass of Russians, who, and particularly of the working class, who have so far been watching what's happening without taking a decisive position for or against either of these two factions of Yeltsin forces. Okay, so uh, let me ask you one, two questions. One, what would a Yeltsin, a capitalist Russia look like if it was possible uh, and if it ever existed? I think it would look maybe like, uh, uh, well, someone said, uh, they think they would become West Germany, but they're going to become Mexico. Well, I don't think they have any chance to become even Mexico, because uh, what is required to set up a capitalist society are certain very basic material conditions, which I don't think really exist in Russia. That is to say, let me give you three main ones. Uh, what's required is to have uh, a capitalist class can't have capitalism without a capitalist class, uh, large enough, uh, wealthy enough to not only uh, buy the means of production, but to invest in them so as to bring the, the technology which they but use. But aren't they up doing up. that now by stealing the, well, uh, the property of the entire nation? I don't think a combination of what they call their mafia, very close to what we call mafia, plus uh, a group of uh, former managers and party bureaucrats, plus a small number of Western capitalists willing to take a very big risk. I don't think that combination, either in terms of the number of people involved and certainly not in terms of the funds which they have available, are anywhere near enough, are anywhere near enough to not just buy the means of production, but to invest in them so that the technology which they use would be able to produce the goods which, right. which the people need. Let me just mention okay. quickly the other two conditions which don't exist. So they don't have anything approaching a capitalist class, and what's going on there is not really uh, sufficient. Secondly, they don't have a working class. Now that might sound odd. There's certainly plenty of workers, but they don't have a working class appropriate to this transition, by which I mean you have to have a mass of workers who are willing, subservient. not just subservient, but who have the, the, the uh, who are willing to allow themselves to have their faces pushed in the mud, will, to be super exploited, at work much longer and much harder than they now are at, at, at even lower wages than they're getting. You take if you look at the third world countries, which have been so-called relatively successful in moving toward capitalism, they've been using teenage girls from the countryside uh, and, and, and other groups which allow themselves to be super exploited. The Russian working class uh, is, is relatively well educated, uh, pretty conscious of themselves as a working class, certain amount of pride. They are not about to allow this kind of change to occur in their life without a major struggle such as hasn't occurred yet between that class and the government. And third, another condition which doesn't exist, there isn't the, the markets abroad uh, for what Russia, a capitalist Russia would produce and have to sell abroad. There will always be markets for the gold and the oil which, which they produce. But for the other things that they would have to sell abroad, those markets are already glutted. They're full of uh, the products from South Korea and Brazil, let alone from Europe. There's and already America. enough competition among Too capitalist much competition. nations. It's the worst possible moment to try to break into the, the world capitalist market. Consequently, these basic conditions for becoming a capitalist society don't exist. Therefore, Yeltsin's on the road toward what he calls a capitalist society, but he can never possibly get there. And this is, I think, the problem of Russia economically. They're trying to go somewhere which it's impossible to get to. All right, let me ask you, let me just step a little bit further back in time. The Soviets, under a horrible dictatorship, seemed to be making uh, material progress up until when, the 50, the 60s? Mm -hmm. Now, what happened? Was it really the Cold War? What, what happened that this uh, horrible, this progress at a horrible expense, material progress, uh, sort of broke down? Well, 
I think it's, it's a complicated issue with, with several pieces, the Cold War and the expenses uh, which they had to put in to keeping up with uh, the United States and Ireland play an, an important role, uh, especially in the 80s with the kind of increases which occurred under the Reagan administration. I give a great deal of importance, though, to the fact that by the 1960s, where is when the various economic indicators suggest the turn came from the great progress they were making, materially speaking, economically speaking, after the war, and rebuilding their country from the destruction of World War II, when the economic indicators suggest that things are leveling off, and then by the 70s, they begin to turn down, the economy begins to turn down. I think that what you see there is that the Russian workers and, and, and peasants were willing to work particularly hard to do their best to be careful and efficient when they not only were being stimulated to do their best by the ideology of the regime and by a little bit of tinkering in the wage system, but also by various nationalist uh, 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 incentives having to do with rebuilding the country after the war. Uh, and when those nationalist incentives were removed because the country by the mid-60s was already pretty rebuilt, then the only, or rather the main incentives for them doing their best had to do with the ideology of the regime where they were supposed to be building socialism. And since they were already becoming pretty cynical, uh, that simply wasn't enough. And what you got from that point on is what we in the States would call working to rule, where workers do as little as they can get away with doing, uh, just enough so that they won't get fired. And so workers in various jobs were not paying attention, not only about how well they did their job, but not paying attention to take good care of the material which was coming in, or the goods with more care, even more attention given to the job by the So they, the utopia was, was retreating all the time. The utopia they'd been promised under socialism, and they, they got tired? Well, they didn't believe that this was really coming about. Uh, I, I made me approach it a little differently. Uh, we know that there was no democracy in, uh, in the Soviet Union, and what that meant is that the workers were being asked to carry out plans which they had no input into. They uh, not only did not elect the planners, they didn't elect the politicians, they had no way of letting the planners know what they thought, uh, and consequently they, these were orders given to them by a government which they felt quite distant. And was there a separation, like was the, was the bureaucracy uh, becoming more and more of a, uh, so we say, uh, parasitic upon the, were they was it becoming more corrupt or... Uh, I don't think it was any more corrupt or less corrupt than it was before. I, I don't think that the Soviet Union, until, until maybe very, very late, suffered that much from corruption. Uh, well, that you wonder much. why it broke at a particular point, you know, when, uh, when the, uh, when they, when they uh, ceased being uh, in love with the, uh, uh, the, the promised uh, socialist utopia. I, I don't like that way of putting it. I don't think many of them were in love with that for a long time because of all that. Well, then why did they break at a particular or stop well, at a I, particular I, I, point? I indicated uh, what happened by the mid '60s. Is I see. They, they had the, during the war. The basics had been reestablished. During right. the war, the main reason they they, they fought so well was it had nothing to do with. Socialism, socialism right. had to do with national I defending see. a okay. country against an aggressor. After the war, the main incentive was rebuilding the country, which right. was destroyed. Now, by the late 50s, early 60s, right. the country was rebuilt, and then why should one... So they had the, the basics, and they weren't going to get uh, that much more by working, by breaking their balls, so to speak. And, and there was a great deal of cynicism about the promises but, made, uh, okay. and they had no input, there was no democratic control over those people who were setting the plant, the, the goal, but they had and, and this was reacted to, but it was a kind of political, for me, it was a kind of a political rebellion in the only form that political rebellion could take in the Soviet Union, which was in economic slowdown All right. to mess so it at up, the be not being At the goal. beginning of the Bolshevik Revolution, at least the rhetoric, and I think some of the reality was uh, that this would be a worker-controlled society that um, the workers would determine uh, 
what was going to happen. Well, that may was that been, ever was well, that ever was that more of a reality in the beginning, and is it just a slow decline, or or they always accepted the fact that uh, well, more of a reality was in, a in, in the sense that when Lenin was still around, that he wasn't around for very long, there was some democratic traditions and practices within the Communist Party. Lenin was defeated on some important votes by the other people in the congresses and central committees in which he participated. But I think what you've got to understand is right from the beginning, there were very few workers in Russia. It's estimated there was something like 10 to 12 percent of the population who were workers, in any sense of that term, in when the, the Russia, when the Bolsheviks won the revolution. So how are you going to have, which is how the party liked to present itself in relation to the ruling class? Well, we're recording now. Yeah. Is it working? Are we working? Okay, so where were we? We were talking about the workers in Russia at the time of the revolution. And I would like to make this point, try to make it quickly. Uh, if somebody doesn't have any legs to it, and uh, they can't run it, how much more does it help in talking about the person having a bad attitude uh, or um, something not having uh, the right kind of uh, running shoes? Uh, clearly, not having legs is uh, not just the main, but should be a sufficient explanation for why they can't run. Okay. Now, let me, let me All right. This is not about running shoes. I know. Uh, the conditions which Marx, the whole Marxist tradition, Lenin, I think for really his entire life, uh, thought would, were necessary in order to build socialism in Russia, which included having a, a, a large working class. That was one of the conditions. Having uh, an industry, uh, having some wealth, uh, having uh, an educated population, uh, having some tradition of democracy. None of these conditions were present in Russia. Consequently, they set about to do the impossible, and it should be no surprise that they did not succeed. They have succeeded at doing something else, among other things, uh, creating quite an industry, sending a Sputnik up, introducing some interesting social programs like socialized medicine, but they didn't come close to having no. any kind of socialism. Now, therefore, part of that picture is having a relationship between the working class and the government which was one where the government really ruled over the workers, though they, they talked as if the workers were the ruling class, and this was not socialism, and this was the situation from the very beginning. All right, also two things. Uh, the revolution was supposed to happen in a, in a highly industrialized country of Western Europe, and it wasn't supposed to be destroyed or, or hemmed in the way uh, Cuba is being destroyed and the way uh, the Nicaraguan revolution was destroyed. Mm -hmm. by uh, uh, a dozen invading armies and all sorts of economic uh, threats and uh, boycotts and interferences and uh, invasions by uh, uh, capitalist Germany. All, all that's true, but I'm saying that isn't the main explanation, that the conditions, even if those things didn't occur, they played a big role. They made things even harder than they would have been. But the conditions were such that they simply could not build socialism. You can't build the look. The number one lesson of Marxist materialism, which the Bolsheviks is that Marxists knew, but they didn't practice it, and that is, you can't build something with nothing. You really can't. You've got to have the something, the material wherewithal, in order to build a, a particular kind of society. They didn't have that material wherewithal in order to build socialism at the time of the revolution or any time after. And incidentally, this is also where summarizing the point I tried to make about what Yeltsin is doing now, because in a way, he is committing the same idealist mistake which the Bolsheviks committed at the beginning. That is to say, he's trying to do something where there is no material base. He is trying to do the impossible when he tries to build capitalism without the conditions for capitalism existing. In a similarly, 
to what the Bolsheviks tried in build, trying to build socialism without the material conditions. Okay, for socialism. we have eight minutes now, and now we're going to hear some of your suggestions about what would be the best thing for the Russians to do for themselves now. Well, I have my ideas on that. I think I'd rather talk about what I think is going to happen. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, what? Well, well, a little of the both. Well, maybe. what? One of the. I indicated at the very beginning that one of, for me, what's crucial is that there's been a split among the Yeltsinites. That weakens Yeltsin in terms of the conflicts up ahead, and particularly the conflict with the working class. Also, what this does, and this is really for me extremely important, is that this separates his government from the forces pushing for and believing in democracy. Because until now, one could say that Yeltsin in some way represented the democratic forces. Now, he quite clearly is a dictator, and he's destroyed what there was of bourgeois democracy, the, the, the seeds, the, the seedlings of bourgeois democracy that were beginning to grow. Consequently, what's going to happen is that those forces pushing for a renewed communism, a renewed form of communism, and those forces who are, that are primarily interested in democracy, those forces which in Russia have been separated since 1917, those forces are going to come together for the first time in opposition to Yeltsin. So that the struggle for a renewed form of communism is now going to intermesh with the struggle for real democracy. I think this is wonderful, both for the struggle for communism and for the struggle for democracy, because the communism which they create, if they can, will be much more democratic, and, with, and the return of democracy will have socialist forms instead of these incipient capitalist forms which have existed for the last few years under Yeltsin. What I see happening is now Yeltsin trying to, as a dictator, to push forward on his capitalist agenda, and that means may, the most important step will be reducing the credits to the, to the large industries and because they're uneconomic. That means that these industries are going to have to reduce their labor force, because what's important is right now, Russia, with a terrible economy, has only something like 2% unemployed, which is very, very low, because workers are going to the factories and getting paid for doing nothing. Okay, now they're going to be fired, but there's no unemployment benefits to speak of. The social services network, which existed even under communism, is disappeared. So these workers are going to have it even harder than they are. We're talking about real starvation here, real, real starvation, and those workers, because this is a working class which has not been destroyed, this is a working class which has not been uh, uh, made fearful by, by mass executions and, and exiles and jailings, this working class, I think, is going to react as a working class. The ability to do so in a coordinated way remains because, among other things, the trade unions continue to exist in Russia so that they can engage in a coordinated activity as a class. I would expect the form this takes to be taking over the enterprises, the factories and the offices, and then in order to do something together to coordinate their activities, to see that they get fed and that their families get fed, they're going to have to set up committees. The word for these committees in, this, in Russia is Soviet. In other words, they're going to set up new Soviets, which will not be under the domination of any one party. I would expect all the parties of the left to participate, so it will be very democratic. The government will try to put this down. But Yeltsin, I don't think, will have the support, having already hived off half of the people who would have supported him, and the army and the secret police and the regular police forces are very weak, very, uh, very, very divided. I don't think they're going to be able easily to meet the demands to put down a massive strike action by the workers, at which point Yeltsin government will collapse, and this new regime emerging out of these new Soviets will become the new government of Russia. I would expect this sort of thing to happen within the next few years. Okay, so what, what, is, what will be the reaction of uh, the, uh, the United States, uh, the capitalist societies of the West? To the they'll be very unhappy. They'll make lots of noises. They'll make threats. But there's not much they can do about it. How are they going to they gonna send an army into Russia to, to occupy the whole of Russia? There's, there's no strategic point. It's not a matter well, of... Well, they tried it in 1918. Uh, well, you can see the kind of fuss we're making right now about sending a couple of dozen, uh, a few hundred soldiers into Haiti. Uh, no, I don't think the numbers that would have to be involved in an action of that sort would be so great that I can't see 
uh, the Western governments doing anything than making threatening noises, and of course, interrupting whatever business deals are then going on, and probably not sending in the rest of the promised aid. But the promised aid is just promises. They've promised and promised and promised, and only book kids have arrived so far. So on this count, the Russians won't be losing very much. Okay. Um, I got an announcement of a meeting of, uh, no date was set, of uh, democratic socialist groups that are forming in the uh, in the Soviet Union. Did you get that thing? I've gotten a number of announcements. Do you think that will be interfered with now by... Uh... Oh, certainly, certainly. Yeltsin has already made a number of groups illegal, including a number of left-wing groups, which had nothing to do with the recent uh, uh, rebellion, if that's what it is, mm -hmm. in, in, in Moscow. So right. Yeltsin is using the opportunity afforded him by that revolt to establish himself as a dictator in Russia, okay. and, and the American government is, uh, and the New York Times and others would talk about him as okay. a Demi Democrat All right. are obscene beyond belief. All right, we have just, we're winding up now. We have one more minute to sum up and one minute for announcements. Uh, all of this that you've told me is uh, fascinating to me, and you know, I had some hints of it, but you see none of this in the... Uh, in the, in the uh, mainstream American press, where would one go to uh, read a little bit more about this and to learn a little more? What What is the media available, or is it available? Uh, there is some of it available in, in papers and magazines people can get. Which the, one? the Nation has had some very good pieces on this. Uh, in these times, I think, has some uh, very good accounts of what's going on in Russia. Uh, the, the magazine Z uh, has also had some interesting material on Russia. Uh, unfortunately, the mass newspapers have all been terrible, and no one has been worse than the New York Times. Uh, recently, they talked, for example, about Yeltsin's destroying uh, a, a Soviet, a, a, a Congress, which was elected under the Communist Times and which was undemocratic. It was elected. It was elected the same time Yeltsin was. This is not the Soviet of the Soviet Union. It's the it's the Congress of Russia. It was the first free election, maybe in the entire history right. of Russia, and Yeltsin destroyed it. Those are the lies of commission, but the great lies are the lies of omission. They don't know. They don't even have the intelligence to talk about what is uh, really happening or understand what is happening. And if they whatever they do understand, they understand from the cap point of view. Uh, next week we're going to continue uh, talking to Bertel and uh, we're going to discuss, examine some of the uh, philosophical and uh, theoretical basis of what we've been talking about. This is Bertel's latest book and uh, this is his previous book and we're going to um, combine the two. And we're also going to, uh, well, I, want, I just wanted to show you that Bertel is a multi-dimensional. Uh, I'm going